Who was Homo erectus? Rarely is there a species that is simultaneously argued to have been both the longest lived hominin species and not to have existed at all. In some ways, this comes down to philosophical debate. Lumpers argue that slight to moderate morphological variation is common among populations of the same species. Splitters, on the other hand, argue these differences amount to multiple species. Limited information of Pleistocene hominins results in many interpretations of the same data. In addition to possibly being the longest-lived homo species, Erectus, if it did exist, was also one of the most widely dispersed hominin species. Exploring the out-of-Africa migration of Erectus will aid in revealing many aspects of its nature. Proceeding with the assumption that Erectus was in fact a species, who were they and what features define them as such? While earlier hominin ancestors, such as the Australopithecines, have been crudely described as bipedal apes, Erectus might be described as the earliest bipedal hominin with human-like form. Emerging about 2 million years ago, Erectus has comparatively shorter arms and longer legs than both earlier hominins and apes. Originating in Africa, this species would eventually inhabit much of Eurasia and even Sundaland. This species had smaller brains than modern day humans, but likely survived until relatively recently. Individuals from this species possess distinct combinations of basal or archaic and derived traits. This means that an early erectus population might have shared many features with the species such as Homo habilis, while also showing morphological features found in later populations of Homo erectus. Early to mid-Pleistocene hominin fossil and artifact sites show that Erectus dispersed to much of the Old World. This species proved itself capable of surviving in savanna, coastal, mountainous, and tropical environments. Plotted on a map, it's tempting to extrapolate the path of the migration out of Africa by simply connecting the dots. The results would look something like this. The question then becomes, does this accurately tell the full story of the Erectus migration out of Africa? Because no African ancient DNA has been recovered before about 20,000 years ago, it isn't a possible source of information when it comes to the movement patterns of Erectus. It also can't help us determine the relationship between the various Erectus fossil specimens. However, there are other ways to leverage the available data and move beyond connecting the dots. For example, each of these studies for these sites compare the morphological features of fossil remains with other Erectus and early Pleistocene hominins. And when the described relationships are mapped together, you might get a node link diagram that looks like this. I should point out this diagram is not mapping genetic or phylogenetic relationships, but instead similarity of various morphological features. Many of these linked individuals existed hundreds of thousands of years apart. And yet, by grouping these similarities of brain morphology, premolar molar patterns, cranial shape, tooth morphology, mandible morphology, brain size, and cranial frontal bone morphology, it allows us to move beyond the crude model of connecting the dots. Utilizing the data from this node link diagram results in a much different out of Africa story. This new story indicates two major waves out of Africa. Sometime before 1.85 million years ago, a small bodied and small brained hominin population migrated out of Africa. It would have traveled through and likely called home portions of the modern day Near East, South Asia, Central and East China, Southeast Spain, and even Indonesia or Sundaland. The second wave out of Africa was undertaken by a larger bodied and larger brain derived erectus, likely between 1.6 and 1.5 million years ago.
This migratory path included portions of the Near East to South Asia and on to East China. A second branch split from the first in the Near East. This branch entered East Europe, traveled through northern Spain, and finally north into France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. The individuals in this wave range in height from about 5 foot 5 inches or 165 centimeters to as tall as 6 foot 1 inches and 185 centimeters. It's safe to say a 5 foot 7 inch individual would be ordinary in this migration. Their brain size likely ranged from 909 cubic centimeters to the 1250 cubic centimeters of Nandong 7 possibly the last surviving erectus, which lived about 118,000 years ago. In comparison, the brain size of the first wave ranged from only about 661 cubic centimeters to 780 cubic centimeters. In height, they likely ranged from 4 foot 5 inches to 5 foot 5 inches tall. But we'll come back to these differences between the first and second wave hominins a little bit later. First, I want to talk about several other interesting aspects of the two-wave model that I noticed. Zooming in on Europe, several patterns emerge. The age of the various sites in Europe in an east-to-west direction caused the site in southern Spain to stick out. The specimen VM-0, found in Ors, Spain, is dated at 1.5 million years old. A connect-the-dots assumption tells us that VM-0 is a terminal of a migration that leaves Africa via the Near East and progresses across Europe, east to west, before terminating in Spain. However, when accounting for the age of these sites, this assumption becomes questionable. From east to west, the ages appear to show a migration from the Near East 1.5 million years ago, through Bulgaria 1.5 million years ago, Italy 1.45 million years ago, to France 1.3 million years ago, and finally to Spain 1.2 million years ago. VM 0's date of 1.65 million years ago does not follow this pattern. TE9 of northern Spain is most morphologically similar to Turconoboy. UB-10749 and Deminisi. The first two represent the larger bodied and larger brain derived erectus, while this last is representative of the basal and small statured form of erectus. VM-0, on the other hand, is most similar to the archaic Homo habilis and DNH134, which might be considered the first and most primitive Homo erectus fossil found. Although TIGNF3 is much younger than TE9 and VM-0, a site dated at 1.78 million years ago in Ain Hanik, Algeria, confirms the North African presence of hominids during this time period. When these points are plotted on the map, the results show an interesting alternative path. Rather than entering southern Spain via the Near East and across Europe, VM 0's ancestors may have entered southern Spain by crossing the Strait of Gibraltar. Without more information, it's not possible to know for sure. We also don't know how they would have actually crossed the strait. This map of Europe reveals another curious pattern. Before 1.2 million years ago, Erectus failed to migrate above the 45th parallel. And yet, by 1 million years ago, they could be found in central Germany and even the eastern coast of the United Kingdom. Something must have happened to cause Erectus to suddenly migrate north. I suspect prior to 1.2 million years ago, glaciers and the harsh climate along their borders kept Erectus from migrating north. If this is true, then these glacial sheets must have retreated by 1 million years ago, allowing Erectus to march north. The location and date of the various sites of this map hint this is a possibility. The fact that the Wallian interglacial of northwest Europe warmed the region sometime between 1.4 and 1 million years ago strengthens this possibility.
I should be clear that this is just a hypothesis I formed after seeing this pattern on the map. Maybe it calls for a deeper exploration in the future. For now, let's zoom out to the old world as a whole and explore a pattern that seems to go against the grain. Though brain and body size seem to increase over time, and other morphological trajectories, such as increasingly small teeth, also change over time, three outliers caught my eye. DAN5-P1 is an individual that lived about 1.6 million years ago in eastern Africa. This is about the same time that the famed Turkana boy lived, although he was discovered about 600 miles southwest of DAN5-P1. At death, Turkana boy had a cranial capacity of 880 cubic centimeters, but he had a projected adult capacity of 909 cubic centimeters. And here's the interesting part. Remarkably, the adult DAN5 individual had a cranial capacity of only 598 cubic centimeters. This is actually the smallest adult Homo erectus cranial capacity ever found. This might indicate morphological variation not only existed across time, but also in contemporary populations or individuals. This is to say both large-bodied and small-bodied erectus individuals existed at the same time and in relatively close proximity to each other. DAN5 appears to represent a remnant or holdover population with basal features. We've already mentioned Tigan F3 of North Africa and these fossil remains represent another outlier. Tigan F3's extremely young geological age in combination with its extreme basal or archaic features and large size make it very interesting. Castro et al. conclude this population is likely a basal erectus population that was isolated in North Africa for hundreds of thousands if not millions of years. Then comes the ultimate remnant population. Homo erectus first migrated into Sundaland or modern day Indonesia about 1.5 million years ago. This population is interesting for two reasons. First, and like Tigan F3, this population seems to originate from a basal source and was part of the first out of Africa wave. There is little indication that a second wave ever made it to Java or Sundaland. This is interesting because it suggests that, like Tigan F3, the population continued to evolve larger bodies and brains in combination with retained primitive traits. But what really classifies this group as a remnant population is the fact that members of the Java erectus population were likely the last erectus individuals to survive as late as 118,000 years ago. While this species as a whole seems to follow a basic trajectory, these three populations are reminders that phenotypic variation continued to vary across space and time. And yet, one can't help but to wonder, is this a demonstration of interspecific variation, or were these populations actually different species? Targeting the low-hanging fruit, Spain is once again front and center. Skeletal specimens TE9 and TD6, dated at 1.26 million and 806,000 years ago, respectively, have been identified as a distinct species. Designated Homo antecessor, this species is large-brained and derived that has a flat face remarkably similar to modern humans. This is probably the first Homo species to evolve outside of Africa. But what about the rest of the erectus populations? Comparing D2700 from Dimanisi, Georgia, and KNM-WT15000, also known as Turkana boy, shows the breadth of phenotypic variation found in the erectus populations. These probably less than accurate depictions of habilis on the left and derived erectus on the right demonstrate how 
many morphological features in individuals before about 1.6 million years ago still have similarities with primitive habilis. On the other hand, after 1.6 million years ago, the fossil traits show derived features that began to cluster away from basal or archaic characteristics. Is this enough evidence to declare early erectus as its own species distinct from later erectus? For some, it is. Some have labeled this basal or stem erectus as Homo ergaster. In this view, it was members from the Homo ergaster population that first migrated out of Africa. Homo erectus would then be responsible for the second wave out of Africa. Erectus is often split further. The large-brained late erectus is given the designation of Homo heidelbergensis, and its range is largely out of Africa in regions such as Europe and China. If scientists hope to determine whether these populations are in fact the same or a distinct species, they will need to move beyond morphological comparisons. In the last 20 years, DNA sequencing technology has progressed exponentially and resulted in the field of ancient DNA exploding. Scientists are now able to characterize how and when our ancestors interbred with our cousins, the Neanderthals and Denisovans. Ancient DNA analysis also allows scientists to investigate population history and ancient ecosystems. Unfortunately, no DNA older than 20,000 years has ever successfully been sequenced in Africa. Outside of Africa, the oldest sequenced hominin DNA of an early Neanderthal is dated to about 435,000 years old. Colder environments such as Northern Europe and Siberia allow DNA molecules to remain intact for much longer than hot and especially humid environments. As long ago as 435,000 years seems, it is not near deep enough in time to shed any light on Homo erectus. Because of this limitation of DNA, a different method must be used to study erectus. Enter a new emerging field. Proteomics may eventually allow us to answer some of the questions that we have raised so far. Rather than analyzing DNA, proteomics analyzes the proteins that DNA produces. The biggest benefit of analyzing proteins is the fact that they are much more robust than DNA molecules and are believed to maintain cohesion for millions and even tens of millions of years. However, there is a major downside of proteomics. To avoid going deep down a rabbit hole, I'm going to grossly oversimplify the relationship between DNA and proteins and how they are analyzed. The human genome consists of 3 billion base pairs. Each of these individual 3 billion adenines, cytosines, guanines, and thymines can be thought of as a data point. It is the difference in these base pairs among various populations or species that allows scientists to tease out migration patterns, admixture events, relationships between populations, and a whole lot more. But only 45 million of the 3 billion base pairs are protein coding genes. This means that less than 2% of the genome is reflected in proteins. When seen as data points, this means that when analyzing proteins, 98% of the human genome is unavailable to explore. But it's actually even worse, because the same amino acid, which combined with other amino acids to form a protein, can be produced from multiple configurations of DNA. Using serine as an example, TCT, TCC, TCA, and TCG all produce the same amino acid. This means that where DNA has four distinct data points, protein is reduced to a single data point. Overall, protein analysis offers much less power to infer patterns than DNA, but it still has the potential to offer valuable insight into deep human origins. For example, protein analysis of both TE9 and TD6 has confirmed they are their own species, and the label of homo antecessor is appropriate. In addition, 
Results indicate that rather than being a direct ancestor of Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, or Denisovans, Homo antecessor was instead a sister lineage to the common ancestor of sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. Researchers have very cleverly leveraged proteins in other ways to learn even more about ancient hominins. A gene called amylogenin is the perfect example. This gene produces short proteins that form in tooth enamel, the hardest and most durable material of the human body. This means these proteins remain stable much longer than DNA molecules. The secret of the amylogenin gene is that it resides in both the X and Y chromosomes, and each produces a slightly different version or isoform of the protein. The X chromosome resident produces a version known as MLX, and the gene on the Y chromosome produces MLY. This means that when researchers analyze tooth enamel, the presence of MLY indicates a male individual and its absence indicates the remains of a female. The ability to determine the sex of an individual is not as trivial as it first seems. When previously discovered and new fossil remains are analyzed, a deeper understanding of the phenotypic variation found in erectus will emerge. For example, are the small bodied erectus fossils indeed distinct populations? Or are many of the samples simply females whose small stature is a result of sexual dimorphism? Answering this question will allow anthropologists to better understand the life history of the species. Answering this question might even indicate likely social behavior, as high sexual dimorphism often results in males battling for reproductive rights with multiple females. Proteomics is a very young field. As databases and libraries of information are built, I suspect its impact on our knowledge of the past, going back millions of years, will increase at lightning speed. The out of Africa success of Erectus, or the species that comprise that label, has left me scratching my head over one common belief of modern humans. It's this belief that big brains and the presumed intellect they produce sets modern humans and their success apart from our bipedal ancestors. And yet, Erectus was able to not only migrate into Europe, Asia, and Sundaland, but often with brains nearly as small as gorillas and chimpanzees. Large brains supposedly afford us the ability to learn to control fire, make protective clothing and footwear, and fend off predators. How did the small brain erectus survive the many challenges of Eurasia? Maybe large brains aren't required to make clothes or control fire. If large brains aren't required to migrate to and survive in Eurasia and Sundaland over many hundreds of thousands of years, how is their success any less special than modern humans who had the advantage of big brains? This brain business has left me wondering something else. How and why did brains continuously evolve into larger brains in many hominin lineages? I ask this from a very particular perspective. When phenotypic traits are discussed, it is often in the context of environment and selective pressures. For example, a loss of trees increased pressure for more efficient locomotion to travel across vast open grasslands. And yet when I look at brain expansion over time, it occurs in many different environments across Eurasia and Sundaland. It seems that at some point, brain expansion became disassociated with environment and selective pressures. Even the large brain size of Neanderthals and modern humans seems to be a continuation of something that was set in motion over a million years ago. I can't help but wonder if rather than a selective pressure being primarily responsible for enlarged brains, maybe an evolutionary constraint was lifted instead. Once the constraint is gone, the brain would evolve to be larger regardless of environment. The obvious answer is the introduction of meat into the diet. 
This increased supply of protein would provide the energy and nutrients required to grow larger brains. In the case of modern humans and Neanderthals, or their last common ancestor, fire and cooking could be added to the mix. Cooking food requires fewer digestive resources, which allows our intestines to shrink and the surplus of energy to be redirected to the brain. Or so the story goes. But what if a different constraint was lifted? Our brains burn about a fifth of the calories consumed. They generate substantial heat, about 20 watts at rest. Unlike furry species who can independently cool their brain by transferring its heat to the mucous membrane present on the large snouts of these animals, humans lack a large snout and the surface area to allow heat from the brain to sufficiently dissipate into the air. In humans, there is some debate whether brain temperature can be regulated independently from body temperature. Once humans evolved hairless, sweaty skin, brain size would no longer be limited by our body's ability to shed heat to cool the brain. Rather than relying on a large snout to radiate the brain's heat, our entire body evolved to essentially become a radiator. In this way, our hairless ancestors were not limited by the heat generated by larger brains. Whether our ancestors and cousins found themselves in a hot or cold environment, brain expansion would no longer be constrained. This hypothesis of brain thermoregulation limiting brain size doesn't have to be mutually exclusive with the adoption of meat in our diet. But, meat or not, without the ability to cool the brain, it is unlikely it would have expanded significantly in our hominin ancestors. One interesting way to test this hypothesis would be to determine to what degree hominin species were covered in hair and map that against brain size, where species like Homo naledi, Homo floresiensis, Homo habilis, or Homo luzonensis hairy? If so, this could account for their small brain size. On the other hand, other ecological factors such as island dwarfism could explain smaller brain size. At this point, we don't have enough information to know one way or another, but it's something to think about for the future. Homo erectus is a divisive species or concept, and yet when you consider everything these human populations accomplished, they really are remarkable. Whether they are considered one continuous species or are divided into multiple species, it can't be denied that this cluster of hominin populations successfully inhabited much of the old world. Like most Dawn of Sapiens videos, this one ends with more questions than answers. To me, it is much more important to lay out the available data than to create a tidy authoritative narrative. With the data laid bare, it becomes much easier to understand the opposing views of anthropologists. Should Erectus be considered one or multiple species? Anthropologists argue from both perspectives. As we have seen, the data, at the very least, shows a continuum of variation of both space and time. It also shows that Erectus migrations were limited by both ecology and environmental factors such as glacial ice sheets. Remnant populations remind us that variation always exists. Erectus is much too ancient to rely on DNA, but help is on the way in the form of proteomics. Keep an eye out for results from this emerging field. Whether Erectus is one or many species, these populations shed light on the question of brain size. Early Erectus had brains not much bigger than chimpanzees. The last Erectus had a brain size that overlaps with that of modern humans. Although paleoanthropologists like Lee Berger and John Hawkes would remind us that not all lineages, see Homo naledi and Homo floresiensis, follow this pattern, brain size continually increased over time regardless of environment or species. What the hell is going on there? We can only hope that advancing technology in paleoanthropology will be able to shed light on the mystery of Homo erectus. Thank <laughs> you.